Well, would you open your Bible, please, at 1 Kings in chapter 17. We're continuing our series entitled Leadership, The Surprising Influence of a Godly Life. And we've seen together that leaders are people who go on a journey and take others with them, and therefore the direction of your journey and the pace at which you move has a great deal to say about the influence of your life. Uh, we looked at two leaders who were moving in, were moving in very different directions. Uh, Ahab charging down this broad road that Jesus says leads to destruction. We saw how he was defining his own morality, he was choosing his own God, he was provoking the anger of God, and ultimately he was ignoring the warning of God, and he's moving down that broad road. And then we saw Elijah, one man who's moving in a different direction. He's on a narrow path of faith and of obedience that leads to life. And we saw what that meant for him. It means submitting himself to God in such a way that he is available any time for any commission that God has for him. It means that he's immersing himself in Scripture so that the Word really carries weight in his own life. It means he's learning to pray in such a way that will advance the glory of God, even though it will be costly for Elijah himself. And we saw that it led him to the place of speaking the truth of God with clarity and with courage so that even Ahab, that uh, king, would know that the Lord uh, lives. And uh, so after this prolonged preparation of uh, uh, immersing himself in the Word of God and, and praying with regards to the will of God, we've got to the point at the end of last week where Elijah's ministry has this stellar launch. I mean, you can't get a more impressive beginning to a ministry than, than Elijah had. He walks right into the throne room of Ahab, this king, and he speaks to him with clarity and courage, the Word of God. He announces to him, Ahab, the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, and because the Lord of God of Israel lives, uh, there will not be rain in the land for these next years, neither will there be dew, and this will be the proof to you that He is the living God. That is a stellar beginning by any standards, uh, an amazing launch for this man's ministry. We he comes on the scene and verse 1 tells us the amazing thing that happens. Now, today, what happens next? Verse 2, the word of the Lord came to him, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith. Now, folks, this is absolutely astonishing after the amazing launch of Elijah's ministry. I'm absolutely persuaded in my own mind that when this Word of God came to Elijah, he must have done a double take. What? We've just launched the ministry. And now you say, God, go hide yourself. Here's this man for, for months and perhaps for years, he's been preparing himself for ministry. He's been immersing himself in the Word of God. He's been giving himself to prayer. And, and now that his ministry is just launched, God says, go hide yourself. Here is a man who has a passion for the glory of God. His, his ministry is desperately needed in this dark time in Israel. We said last time, he's the brightest light in the darkest place at the hardest time. Here's the man who has the courage to do what no one else will do, to go into the throne room of Ahab and to announce the reality of the living God. And God now says to him, the very next verse, go hide yourself. So, I would have struggled over this if I'd been Elijah. What do you think? I think you would have struggled with it too. I expect that Elijah struggled with this. Because I know what I would have been thinking if I had had the courage to go to Ahab, and if I had been given the privilege of that amazing launch of a ministry, I would have been saying to folks around me something like this. I would have been saying, well, now's the time for a national preaching tour. Now's the time, now that we've announced it in the palace, now's the time that we've got to take the message of Deuteronomy in chapter 11 to every person in this nation. Let's tell the covenant people of God the message of Deuteronomy in chapter 11 that if you turn to idols, there will be no rain, because this is the time when they can see that 
the very proof of the promise of God in their experience. So let's go tell them. Let's go and call them to repentance. Let's get out the map right now and decide where we're going to begin on this national tour. And God says, no, you go hide yourself by the brook, Cherith. Now, I'm going to suggest to you today that the Cherith experience comes to every Christian at some point in your journey. I've known it, will no doubt know it again, and I expect that many of you have discovered it already. Some of you are there now, and others will be there in the future. Cherith is where God closes the door on the thing that you most want to do. I'm going to try and describe the Cherith experience so that you can recognize it in your own life. And then I want to remind you today that God is at work in Cherith as much as He is at work on Mount Carmel. And today the outline is very, very simple. I think the simplest outline we've ever had. Here's what God is doing for Elijah at Cherith. God hid him, God led him, and God fed him. That's as simple an outline as you can get, right? God hid him, God led him, and God fed him. Let's start here, then God hid him. Verse 3, depart from here and turn eastward, the Lord says, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith. Now, the question obviously arises, why did God hide Elijah? Was this for his protection? Maybe. But God was able to protect Elijah, you remember, when he went right into the palace of Ahab. And God was able to protect Elijah and the company of hundreds of prophets of Baal when he's on the top of Mount Carmel. We're going to see in a couple of weeks' time when God next meets Ahab out in the desert, God is able to protect Elijah there too. So God did not need to send Elijah to Cherith in order to protect him. There's something much more than that that's going on here. Was it a judgment on the people of God? Undoubtedly, yes. One way in which God judges a nation is that He hides the teachers of the Word of God. He hides His servants, and what happens is there is a famine of the Word of God. There's no doubt that God was doing that here. But I want to press further and ask the question, what was God doing in the life of Elijah? What was this about for him? Cherith is the place where God withholds what you wanted most. Cherith is the place where God closes the door on the very thing that you wanted to do for him. Here's Elijah. Think about it. Get it into your mind. He's been preparing himself for ministry at huge personal cost, and now he finds that he does not have the opportunity to pursue it. He's a prophet. That means his whole calling is to speak the Word of God into the lives of people. There are no people at Cherith. And after he moves on from Cherith, and we're going to look at this next week, God willing, we'll see that he's given a massive congregation of two people for three years. One's a widow and the other is her son. That's the only people he's able to minister to after all this preparation and the amazing launch in the palace. That's all the extent of his ministry for three full years. What is all this about? You go to college. You train for a particular career. Then you graduate, and the door that you expected to open does not open for you as you thought. All this preparation, and where's the opportunity? You say, I've got the skills, I've got the training, I've spent an awful lot to get into this position, but there doesn't seem to be a place where I can use them. The door is not open for me. Friend, welcome to Cherith. Welcome to Cherith. God can take you to Cherith by removing you from a position. God can take you to Cherith through an illness that changes what you had hoped to do and puts you in a different place. Cherith is the place where God hides you. It is the place where God holds back what you most wanted to to do. I remember when I was a small boy, our family visiting a town in the south of England when we were on 
family vacation. We went there quite often. And when we did, we visited a church that I thought was the most marvelous place on the face of the earth. Little kids sitting up there in the gallery. The pastors of that church were heroes of mine. The singing was an inspiration. The gallery was packed with young people. And I used to think, if ever I got to be the pastor of this church, boy, that would be my greatest dream. Karen and I um, began our ministry in a small church of about 150 people in the north of London. The church grew, and the elders and the deacons began to talk about a new building. We had been there eight years, uh, which is a very respectable length of time for uh, a young pastor in his first pastorate. And one night, the uh, elders, as they were pursuing this discussion, they said to me, now, Colin, if we do this, if we launch out on this project, we're going to need to be real sure that there's stability of leadership. And they said to me in the meeting, um, are you prepared to commit to staying here, they said, for another five years? I, I'd been there for eight. They said, are you prepared to commit um, for another five years? Can they, they probably shouldn't have asked that. But I received the question without offense. I, I, I said, yeah, yeah. I'm all in. The following day, the phone rang in our home. It was a man I'd never met before, but he introduced himself as the chairman of a search committee from the church that I had dreamed about as a boy. The following day. And he said this, Colin, we've never met but uh, I want you to know we're looking to appoint a new senior pastor. And he said, we want to know if you would be a candidate. And I said to him, I would love to do that, but I can't. And he said immediately what any evangelical Christian would say. He said, well, won't you pray about it? <laughs> and I said to him, I can't even say I'll pray about it, and I'll tell you why. Because last night, I gave my word to the elders of our church in response to a question that they asked me, and there would be no integrity whatsoever if I today said that I would be willing to come and speak with you. That was about the extent of the conversation. I put down the phone. I walked through to the kitchen where Karen was, and I said, I cannot believe the conversation that just happened. Everyone knows about the triumphs of Elijah's ministry on Mount Carmel. But here is the principle. God will take you to Cherith before he ever takes you to Carmel. You'll find this principle all the way through the Scriptures if you look at people who have been greatly used by God. God hid Joseph in a prison before he was brought into the household of Pharaoh. God hid Moses in the backside of the desert, the Bible says, for a third of his life before God raised him up to lead the people of Israel out across the Red Sea. God hid David for a prolonged period of time, running in and out of caves and different places in the mountains while Saul was chasing him for his life before he was ever brought to the palace and given the throne and recognized as the king. God hid Paul for three years in Arabia after his conversion and before he launched out on his first mission journey. Three years hidden. And God hid Elijah at Cherith before his great life contribution that came at Carmel. So, I'm saying to you from this today, don't count it a strange thing if God hides you. Here's the principle. When God chooses to hide you for a time, He is preparing you for a greater purpose. 
Last month, uh, I was able to visit the church that I served with great joy in, in London. In the end, we served there for 16 years. They still never had the new building. That was given that joy to my successor. Um, but visiting back and rejoicing in all that God has done, um, it was marvelous to meet up with so many people and to see the blessing of God in different lives. One of them was a dear brother who has served the Lord faithfully over many years. I've known him now for 32 years. Uh, always there, always reliable, always steady. Throughout the years where he served as a, as a lay leader in the church, he was never really very happy in his job. He, it, there was nothing wrong with the job, but it, it was dull. It was not fulfilling to him. There was something in his heart that wanted to do something more with his life. Then about 10 years ago, God opened a new door of opportunity for this man that took the skills that had been honed over years in this rather dull and unexciting environment and put the same set of skills that had been honed there into use in a completely different setting that has been bringing him great joy. We've kept in touch, and uh, so when I saw him um, last month, I said to him, well, I said, your life has certainly changed since I saw you last. He said to me, yes, it has. He said, you know, someone said to me, the second half of your life will be much more fruitful than the first. And he said, you know, I really feel that that is proving to be wonderfully true. So I want to give you this encouragement today. Don't be surprised if God hides you. Don't be discouraged when he does. We serve a God who hides his servants, and while they are hidden, he works in them so that later, with greater power, he may work through them. And if you know that, you'll be greatly helped when you find yourself at Cherith. That's the first thing. God hid him. Second, at Cherith, God led him. God led him. Look at verse 2. The word of the Lord came to him, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself at the brook Cherith. So verse 3, he went and did, uh, verse 5, I'm sorry, he went and did according to the word of the Lord. So God led him to Cherith, and as we'll see next week, God led him out from Cherith. It will be the same for you. As a believer, you can have absolute confidence in God's leading of your life in every circumstance. The Lord is your shepherd, and the Lord is your shepherd even at Cherith. Now, here's the principle that's important for us to uh, grasp with regards to how God leads us. God leads His people one step at a time as we walk with Him in obedience. That's a very important principle. God does not normally lay out the long-term scenario. What He does is He leads His people one step at a time as we walk and take each step in obedience. So, when Elijah went into the throne room and made his great announcement to Ahab, at that moment he didn't have the slightest idea what was going to happen next. And you will find yourself in that position. You take a step of obedience to God, you just don't know what is going to happen next. But as you take the step of obedience to God, here's what will happen. As you move with God in obedience, so He will reveal the next step to you. And that's the importance of the link between verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 tells us about Elijah's step of faith and obedience. Verse 2, then God tells him what to do next. The same pattern is in verse 5. Verse 5 tells us about Elijah's obedience. He went and did according to the word of the Lord. What happens next? Verse 8, God tells him to do what is next. The word of the Lord came and said, go to Zarephath. So, you find this. It's a repeated pattern throughout the story. The word of the Lord comes to Elijah. Elijah does what the word of the Lord says. Then the word of the Lord comes to him and tells him what to do next. 
Now, here's something that we can learn from that, and it's worth pondering. If God is not making your next step clear, perhaps it could be that you have not yet finished what He is calling you to do already. Think about that. He reveals each step as we move in obedience. If God has not made your next step clear, could it be that you have not yet finished what He has already told you to do? Move forward with all that God has given you to do now, and then trust Him to show you the next step at the right time. That's the principle of Christian obedience. So, of course, planning is good. Every Christian leader should have a plan. Every church should have a plan. Every business should have a plan. Every family should have a plan. Every parent should have a plan. But you know what happens to our best plans. To quote Robert Burns, who gets in now and again, the best laid schemes of mice and men go off to awry and leave us naught but grief and pain for promised joy. You've got all your plans. Oh, this is what we're going to do. And the best laid plan, says Burns, of mice and men, they just go awry. They, 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 they go up, and, and instead of the promised joy, you find a whole lot of grief and pain. That's, that's human experience. Here's how God puts it in Scripture. The heart of man plans his ways, but it is the Lord who establishes his steps. Isn't that interesting? See, the heart of man plans his ways, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a right thing to do, to look ahead, to take the long-term view, to try and fix your eye on some point that's further ahead. This is my aim. This is my goal. This is what I hope to do. The heart of man plans his way. That's good. That's right. But it is the Lord that establishes his steps. So, when my plans fail, I am to remember that it is the Lord who establishes my steps. One of our pastors, when we were talking about these scriptures together, just made this very perceptive comment. Every leader wants to lead, but all leaders lead on God's timetable. That's very helpful. That's very helpful. God leads His people one step at a time, and He will guide you as you need the next step as you move in faith and obedience. Now, of course, just before we move on, there is a very important difference between the way in which God led Elijah and the way in which He leads us. God spoke directly to Elijah. We keep having this phrase, the Word of God came to him. I understand that to mean that he heard God speak with an audible voice, as God spoke with an audible voice in the baptism of Jesus. Do you remember? This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And at the transfiguration, the same words, listen to Him. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Remember the audible voice that the Apostle Paul heard from the risen Christ on the Damascus road. Well, it seems to me that this is how God spoke to the prophets. The Word of the Lord came to Elijah. Chapter 17, verse 2, chapter 17, verse 8, chapter 18, and verse 1. This is what it meant to be a prophet in the Old Testament. Prophets receive direct revelation from God, which is why we don't sit around trying to test whether we agree with what God said to Elijah. It's the Word of God. God spoke to him directly, and through him speaks to us. But that gift is not promised to us. Oh, sure, God could speak in an audible voice to any of us if He chose, but this is not how God normally chooses to work. God does not say in an audible voice to you, go to this college, choose this major, marry that man or that woman, join this church, pursue this career, and so forth and so on. Now, you may wish that He did. You say, well, if He would do that, I'd know exactly what to do. Yeah, that would make you like one of the prophets, and don't envy the prophets. God gave them the toughest things to do, and uh, believing people stoned them. (laughs) That's what Jesus says. They stoned the prophets, killed them. So, don't envy the prophets. But the question remains, 
given that God speaks directly, direct revelation to the apostles and the prophets, which is why the apostles and the prophets are, are foundational. There's not a foundation that can be relayed. That's in the book of Ephesians. How then does God lead us? How can we discern what He wants us to do? Let me simply give to you um, this wisdom that I've drawn from others. Ask what is the best that I can do for my God, and then read your heart and use your judgment. Ask the question, what is the best that I can do for my God? Because that's what you're here for, to live for His glory, to be as useful in your short life to Him as you possibly can be, whatever He places you. What's the best that I can do for my God? And then read your heart and use your judgment because God's guidance comes through a meshing of the desires of your heart and the judgment of wisdom as you pursue doing the best you can for the glory of God. Dr. Jim Packer, who is so helpful in demystifying this whole issue of guidance, which desperately needs to be demystified for, for some of us, he says this, when God has a particular career in mind for a person, what does He do? He bestows on that person an interest in that field of expertise. When God plans for two people to marry, He blends their hearts. But God's inclinings of the heart, as opposed to our own self-generated ambitions and longings, they're two different things, are experienced only as meshing in with the judgments of wisdom. Thus, he says, interest in an unsuitable person as a life partner or interest in a ministry that is beyond one's ability should be seen as a temptation rather than a divine call. You see what he's saying? We, we live with this problem. How do I know when it's God and how do I know when it's me? How do I know simply if I'm looking at my own heart's inclinations and I'm trying, uh, uh, how do I know when that's of the Lord and how do I know when it's of myself? And Packer says, well, you apply the judgment of wisdom. And you may like to get other people to help you in that process, because God will lead you on paths of wisdom. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom, so He's not going to lead you contrary to the path of wisdom. So here, the greatest calling of a Christian believer is to walk the path of wisdom, asking the question, what is the best that I can do for God, and discerning the right steps by the inclinations of the heart uh, in relation to the, what, the judgment of wisdom. In Packer's words, the right course is always to choose the wisest means to the noblest end. That's very helpful. And God has given you His Spirit to help you as you uh, needs direction, and He will lead you. But this is how He will lead you in helping you to discern the wisest means to the noblest ends. So, what is God doing for uh, Elijah? Well, He's doing two things at Cherith. He hides him as the first, and He leads him is the second. That leaves one more. God fed him, hid him, led him, Fed him. Verse 4, you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. And verse 6, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. Now, in this miraculous provision, these birds that flew at the command of Almighty God uh, were the means by which Elijah was brought food every morning and every evening. This was a miracle of grace comparable to the manna in the wilderness. You remember that God provided every day uh, as uh, His people were in the desert. And what we're being told is that God provided for this man everything that he needed during this most difficult time in his life. And that is a marvelous reassurance for us. Now, notice that it was a brook. It was not a river. Um, Elijah might have preferred a river. You probably are wishing that God would give you a river of provision rather than the brook of provision that you may have. 
but the brook contained what he needed. And as for the food delivered by the ravens, not exactly what you would call fine dining, not exactly what they were enjoying, um, chowing on at Jezebel's table, but enough to keep body and soul together in this hardest, hardest time of life. God sustained his servant through the drought, and God will do the same for you at Cherith if you are pursuing him in faith and obedience. Remember this, there's a condition in God's great promise. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. You seek first his righteousness. You seek first his kingdom. You be like Elijah and go after God, and you can trust him with all the rest. Don't imagine for a minute that if you're living any old way that you please, that that's a promise for you. But if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, if you're seeking to walk the path of faith and of obedience and to honor Christ in your life, then when you come into the hardest time and the hardest situation, take this promise, all these things will be added unto you. And take to yourself as a legitimate application, God sustained his servant Elijah, and as I seek to walk as Elijah walked, God will also sustain me. Wonderful truth. God hid him, God led him, and God fed him. Now, here's the striking thing that I want you to notice, and it has a powerful application for us at the end of the message today. The striking thing is that the birds that flew at the command of God and provided the life-sustaining food for Elijah were ravens. You say, why is that striking? Well, it is fascinating because in the Bible, ravens are among the unclean birds. You remember that in the Old Testament, God gave laws about what His people could eat and what they could not eat. And in these Old Testament laws that you'll find in Leviticus in chapter 11, if you want to check them out, you will discover that ravens were definitely off limits. In fact, they're described as detestable. Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 16. And so it is very surprising that when God chooses to bring uh, life-sustaining food to His faithful servant out there by the brook Cherith, that God chooses to do it by means of ravens. And this teaches us a very simple, and it's a very important truth, that God can deliver life-sustaining truth at food through unclean birds. God can deliver life-sustaining food through unclean birds. Think about that. Because you may have had the experience in your life of being fed by an unclean bird. You say, what do you mean? I mean this. Maybe you were taught by a Sunday school teacher, you were taught the Bible by a Sunday school teacher, or a pastor, or a Christian friend, or someone who discipled you at at college or whatever, and you looked up to that person, and you saw them as a role model, as an example. And then some years later, you found out that that person was not what you thought they were. Maybe they committed a crime. Maybe they abandoned the faith that they once taught you. And you were left saying, now, wait a minute, what in the world was happening here? What is all this about? How could this possibly happen? I received spiritual food from this person, and now I find that they're denying the very thing that they taught to me. What in the world is all this about? And you felt robbed. I know this experience myself. And if it has happened to you, it will greatly help you to know and to remember that God can deliver clean food even through an unclean bird. Maybe the person who led you to Christ has subsequently abandoned their faith in Jesus. And you're left saying, what does that say about me? What does that mean for my faith? You remember in the Gospels that Jesus sent out 12 apostles on mission. 
And they went out, and they were remarkably used and uh, wonderfully blessed in all that they did. People would have come to faith in Christ through each of their ministries. Can you imagine meeting these people? Because one day you will in heaven. And you say, now, how did you come to Christ? And one of them says, oh, I was led to Christ by Peter. And you talk to someone else, and you now, how did you come to faith? Oh, I was led to Christ by the Apostle John. Big smile on the face. There's someone over here, and they're not coming forward or saying anything. You know why. You say, how did you come to faith in Jesus? Actually, through Judas. Don't really like to mention it. You say, is that actually possible? Could that happen? Could it be that someone could be led to a genuine faith by someone who did not have it themselves? Absolutely. God can create genuine faith through the ministry of fake believers. And the reason for that is this. It is the gospel that saves, not the person who speaks the gospel. You are saved by the power of the gospel, not by the integrity of the person who spoke it to you. You desperately need to know that if you've been let down by the person who spoke it to you. And if you discovered that at their core they turned out to be an unclean bird, you really need to understand this. You may say, now, wait a minute. Are you saying to me that integrity doesn't matter? Of course not. Of course integrity matters. Lack of integrity amongst those who speak in the name of Jesus Christ in a Sunday school class or even from a pulpit like this is the reason why Jesus says that he will say to many on the last day, many who have served in ministries, many who have served in churches, many who have taught Sunday school classes to little children, and he will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. But remember what they then say. They say, no, wait a minute, we've done all these works. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? Listen, God can create genuine faith even through the ministry of fake believers. So, let that come as an alarm bell to any person in our congregation who says, in their mind and in their heart, well, now I'm involved in ministry. God blesses what I do. God must be pleased with me. And I say to you, remember the ravens. Because the fact that God is using you does not make you clean. Service is never a substitute for holiness. And without holiness, the Bible says, no one will see the Lord. No one enters heaven because of service. So beware of being an unclean bird who flies high in the service of God. Being in ministry of whatever form or whatever shape can never make you clean. Service is never a substitute for holiness. It is possible to do good for the church and still to be a raven. Folks, this is serious. What could be more tragic for a Sunday school teacher to, to, to stand on the last day and to see children that he taught and young people that she taught entering into everlasting life, but because of being an unclean bird, that man, that woman, that teacher remains outside him or herself? If you are resting today on your involvement in ministry as the basis of your standing before God, I urge you with all that is within me today to place your life today under the blood of Jesus Christ that alone can make you clean. Nobody is justified by service. Nobody is justified by going on a mission trip. Nobody is justified by serving the poor. 
There is only one way for you to be made clean before God, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your life as you embrace Him as your Lord and as your Savior. And the blood of Jesus is applied to the humble and to the penitent, not to the self-confident or the self-righteous. So God hides his servants at Cherith, and when they're there, he leads them, and he feeds them. Let me give you one more phrase as we wrap this up. At Cherith, we learn to live on God. At Cherith, we learn to live on God. I take the phrase from John Bunyan, his cherith, came when the man was thrown in prison. Here he is, a pastor serving the Lord. He has a family. It's a time of persecution for believers like us in England, and Bunyan's taken from his church. He's taken from his family. He's incarcerated in a prison in, in Bedford, and God takes this man out of public ministry. He hides him there in the jail. And when Bunyan wrote about his Cherith experience, he said that he had learned there to live upon God who is invisible. And what he's saying is this, God put me suddenly in a place where I could no longer live on my work. God put me in a place where I could no longer live on my family, a place where I could no longer live on my friends or on my pleasures or on my ministry. I was put by God in a place where I had to live on Him who is invisible. And that's where Elijah was at Cherith. To live on God who is invisible means to find what you need in God when there isn't anything else and there isn't anyone else, and that's what God does at Cherith, and He takes His servants to Cherith before He takes them Carmel. So, when you come to the place where God hides, you know this. If you will walk with Him in faith and obedience, even here, He will lead you, and He will feed you. You will find that He is faithful to you, even in Cherith. And you will come out saying, even Cherith was in the purpose of God for me. Will you pray with me, please? The Bible says to believers, your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. Father, thank you that you hide us in Christ, that you feed us with Christ, and you lead us through Christ. Help us to walk with you in faith and obedience, even in Cherith. Help us to discern your hand at work, even there. Help us to find joy in your provision for us, even in the brook, and even with the food that is brought by the ravens. And help us to look forward with hope to what you will yet do for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray. And everyone together said,